All right. How's it going? This all fixed up. Yeah. All right. Ready to go. Talk about CRISPR today. I'm excited. And a little out of breath. I've just been uh, running around and doing shit. A lot of shit all day. Oh, gosh. So, uh, forgive, forgive me being out of breath. Uh, all right. CRISPR, CRISPR, CRISPR. That's what we're going to talk about. <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> so, CRISPR. Um, there's a lot of hype around CRISPR. I'm sure you all have heard about CRISPR. Um, if not... What have you been doing? Um, the thing is, CRISPR is great for research. Um, it's a generally good tool. But for medical purposes, CRISPR is actually... Um, its usefulness isn't as great as people would imagine. Um, and we'll talk about why later, but it's because... Um, the effectiveness of CRISPR is really small. In research, it doesn't really matter too much. But in medicine, that matters a whole lot. So the chances that CRISPR ever gets used directly as a treatment for a disease, I think is negligible. Now, all the stuff you hear about CRISPR being used as a treatment, it, it's not CRISPR being used as a treatment. What they do is, they remove cells from the patient's body, edit those cells with CRISPR, take the edited ones and put them back in the patient's body. So, uh, you know, I don't really view that as using CRISPR on somebody or on, on a human. It's a little different. Um, but yeah, thanks for this beer. Um, Barry, Barry got me some beer. Thank you, Barry, for sending me some beer. I appreciate it. After a long day of working and then teaching a class, you know, it's good to sit down and have a beer while I teach. So, let's talk a bit about how CRISPR works, in case you don't know. All right. Let me change my screen. Um, all right. There's it showing up. It's like we can only see my face still. We got to move it up. All right. <coughs> There we go, CRISPR, oh yeah, all right. So today we are going to talk about CRISPR. Oh, I need to plug in my uh, drawing board. That's why it's not working. All right. CRISPR. Now, I don't think anybody can remember the name of CRISPR. And uh, that's okay because it doesn't actually mean anything that's related to what CRISPR is. And that's super annoying. So CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly interspaced <coughs> short palindromic repeats now why what is that and what does that mean well so when CRISPR was first discovered it was discovered 
that there were clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats in the genome. And people were like, what are these clustered and regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats? Um, and after a bunch of work, they finally found out that it was part of a bacterial immune system. Yes, really. Bacterial immune system. So, <clears throat> so after they discovered that, it wasn't long until people started to figure out that CRISPR, CRISPR could be used for other stuff. Now, why is that? So the way CRISPR worked was in the genome of bacteria, so we got our genome here, we'll think of this as our genome, you had your little CRISPR repeats in there. Now the CRISPR repeats were kind of like antibodies, so to speak. What happened was, there was this protein, Cas9, or just Cas, and Cas just stands for CRISPR-associated protein. There's a lot of Cas's. I don't know exactly how high it goes up, but it goes up higher than 9. So they found that Cas9 specifically, what it did was it interacted with these short palindromic repeats and it targeted viral DNA. I think it's just DNA. I don't know if it's also RNA. A lot of viruses are RNA. Um, so phage, viral, phages are viruses and bacteria. And what it would do is it would come up and it would just chop up, you know, this, uh, it would chop up the phage DNA at the places that the short palindromic repeats told it to. Um, and so, when they figured out that CRISPR could cut DNA, that's when the race is on. Now, why is that the case? So we've known for a long, long time, if this is our genome, human genome, that if you cut DNA, right, if DNA gets damaged and cut, what happens is some repair enzymes come in. And uh, these repair enzymes what they do is they come in and they stitch the DNA back together, just like that. That's interesting because what they also figured out is that during this process, what goes on is a process called homologous recombination. Now, what homologous recombination is, is that the genome will sometimes use a, another copy of the genome, right? Because we have two sets of each of our chromosomes. <laughs> and it will replace the part that's damaged with the part from the other chromosome. And so what you get is you get a recombination event, right? Yeah. And uh, they started to think, well, what happens if we, in instead of it replacing with um, DNA from another chromosome, what, what happens if we add in our own DNA? So then what scientists did was they cut the genome and they added in their own DNA. And as you can imagine where this is going, what happened was that this DNA 
you know? Gets inserted into the genome. The only caveat is, is that it's got to look a lot like the sequences around where the cut occurs, right? And that's where the word homology comes in. Homology means descent through ancestry. In, in terms of DNA, homology means DNA that is the same, right? So what you can do is you can put in DNA that is the same. So the enzymes, the repair enzymes, think that it's a copy of the genome and it uses it to repair. Simple. Now, before CRISPR, people did this a lot of different ways. The two major ways were zinc finger nucleases, zinc finger nucleases. And what these did was they used a DNA binding protein called the zinc finger and they attached a nuclease to the zinc finger. So when the zinc finger bound DNA, the nuclease would cut it. So you could tell the zinc finger where to bind DNA and the nuclease would cut near the zinc finger. Those were okay, not too bad, but you still had to engineer zinc fingers to bind DNA. And uh, they're protein, so that is difficult. The other was talons, which is tail associated something, something. Look it up. I can't memorize all this shit. And uh, they, you could program the protein to bind specific areas of DNA, but it was also kind of complicated, and there was only specific sequences you can use. Now, the first ever um, drug that uses genome editing was a zinc finger nuclease. Um, it was developed by Sangamo, and... Uh, Zinc finger nuclease, at least I think it was. Was it zinc finger nuclease or a talon? Um, pretty sure it's a zinc finger nuclease. Sangamo ZFN. Yeah, Sangamo uses zinc finger nucleases. Um, <coughs> so, the thing is, is that homologous recombination using these is not really possible, right? So there are a few problems when you're thinking about genome editing, okay? The first problem is when you got a cell, you have to get Cas9 enzyme or zinc finger nuclease inside the cell and then inside the nucleus of the cell. It's a mammalian cell, right? So when you do that, immediately the probability of being successful drops a lot. <coughs> You're not gonna be able to edit um, every cell. The next thing that has to happen is once inside the cell, the DNA has to survive and it has to make your Cas9 or zinc finger nuclease and all that stuff, right? So we're talking about the probability drops even more. After that, it has to cut the genome. And the probability drops even more. After it cuts the genome, the material for the homologous recombination, the DNA, also has to do all these things. So now that double drops, that double drops, that double drops, right? So by the time you get to the end of all this, where you got Cas9 and template, we call it the template DNA. Um, your probabilities are pretty low at this point.
okay? And so your chances of getting a homologous recombination to work inside, say, a living human, the, act the, the chances that um, it does anything is very small, very small, you know? But luckily, there's another thing that these um, DNA cutting enzymes do. You can imagine that when you cut DNA, so you got your DNA, when you cut it, Sometimes when the repair enzyme comes in and fixes it up, it makes mistakes, right? It adds in an extra base pair in accident or adds in something else. What they call that is non-homologous enzyming, right? So remember when we were talking about homologous? Yeah, non-homologous end joining. So, this means that the DNA is repaired, but without anything that's homologous, has homology, and you get an error. And when you have that error, what happens is the DNA doesn't work properly usually, right? If the DNA doesn't work properly, then if you have, say, a bad gene, right? I don't know, what is that, like a vampire or something? If you have a bad gene, what you can do is you could stop it from doing anything bad by making errors in it using non-homologous enzyming, <laughs> right? And uh, that is the only way that you can really use these genome editing technologies inside humans, inside, you know, most living organisms. All right, any questions? Any questions so far, right? <clears throat> so when you're doing research with things, animals, or other things, generally you can use HDR um, homology-directed repair or homolo homologous recombination, HR. <clears throat> Um, but in most cases, the only thing you have access to is non-homologous enzyming, right? So now you think about, well, how many genes are actually available to do non-homologous enzyming? The answer is there's not that many, right? Because you basically have to kill the whole gene. <coughs> so it has to be a pretty bad gene in order to uh, just knock the whole thing out and hope it helps the person, right? Um, most of the time, what you can do is you can just put in a good copy of the gene using a uh, plasmid DNA. You know, we talked about plasmids. You can just put in a good copy of gene inside the human body, inside the cell, and that does enough good to overcome the bad copy of the gene. All right. So CRISPR, how does it work? Now CRISPR cuts the genome as we already talked about. There's three main parts about CRISPR. Four, but it's actually three. One is the Cas enzyme. Usually it's Cas9. In this class we use Cas9. In the majority of cases people use Cas9. Um, you know, sometimes people talk about other Cas's, Cas12 and Cas... 
AB6B and other shit, but honestly, it's going to be rare if you ever use something other than Cas9, at least until somebody finds out something good. The second is what's called a CRRNA. And the third is what's called a tracer RNA. <clears throat> these are complicated. Um, these RNAs interact with each other and interact with the Cas9 protein. But what happened is uh, Jennifer Doudna, um, she figured out that you can combine, well, her graduate students and postdocs. I don't think she did any of the experiments. So forgive me. Um, Jennifer Doudna's graduate students and postdocs probably um, figured out that you could combine these two into one, which we now call a gRNA um, or an sgRNA. And I'm sorry for all the terminology here. It's not my fault, which means a guide RNA or a synthetic guide RNA. They both are the same thing. Um, but people use every everything. So if you hear tracer and crRNA, know that usually they've been replaced by guide RNA nowadays. Some people still use tracer and crRNA. Some people say that you can get better efficiency if you use the tracer and crRNA instead of a guide RNA. But, you know, it's pretty questionable. And the last thing is the template DNA. Now, you're only going to have template DNA if you're doing homologous recombination, homology directed repair. Right? The template DNA is usually a single stranded piece of DNA, but it can be double stranded. And, uh, this piece of DNA is usually added to the cell along with the Cas9 and the guide RNA, right? So the things that you absolutely need are the Cas9 and the guide RNA. And then if you're trying to not just cut the genome and disrupt a gene, you're trying to edit a gene, then you also need a piece of template DNA, right? That's the experiment in the class. We use a, a Cas9, a guide RNA, and a piece of template DNA. So we have these three things. Now with bacteria, it's really easy, easier, much easier to do a homology-directed repair than it is on a living, growing, moving organism, as you can imagine. So um, that's why we do it. <clears throat> All right. Any questions? Anything? Just let me know. Give me a shout out. Say something. All right. So how does this work? Now there's a couple ways you can do CRISPR. So, the first way, which is not so popular, is you have the Cas9 protein synthesized, it's purified, so you have the Cas9 protein. You have the gRNA synthesized, you combine these two. And then you transform it into the organism and uh, see what happens. Now, this is a lot more cumbersome and uh, it's not as easy because getting the protein and gRNA into the nucleus is a lot more difficult than getting DNA, DNA in there. The second method is you take a piece of DNA, usually a plasmid, 
and you encode in the plasmid the Cas9 protein and your gRNA. So they're in DNA, not RNA. I mean, they're in DNA, not, not as protein or RNA. And DNA has an easier time getting in the cell and uh, getting into the nucleus and, and stuff like that. So the DNA, you can, it's easy to make, it's easy to purify. Um, DNA is usually a better choice. The third method is you make the DNA and you put it in a virus. There are two viruses that people generally use, AAV and Lenti virus. Now, AAV is what everybody uses for clinical trials and everything nowadays, and it's, it's pretty harmless, we found out. The problem with AAV is it's small. Um, it holds, I think it's around 4.5 thousand base pairs <coughs> um, AAV genome size 4.7 I was off oh wait is that 4.7 with the ITRs okay yeah no so it's about um, Uh, 4.4. It's about 4.4, 4.5 because you got these two ITRs. <coughs> so AAV is pretty small. You can't package that much, right? So if you talk about a Cas9 protein is uh, I think it's 900 amino acids um, which is about 2700 cast they made shorter um, proteins but uh, cast 9 how big is its size yeah so cast 9 right is going to take up, so you got a promoter, your CMV promoter, which helps make the Cas9. That's like, what, 600 base pairs. You got your Terminator, that's another 200. You got Cas9, which is, I think, like 2,700. So right there, you're at like um, 3,500. No, 4,200. No, I was right, 3,500. That's 3,300, 35. You're at 3.5 kb. So you got 1 kb left, right? And then if you're going to do your guide RNA plus U6 promoter plus terminator, you're talking about another um, one little, uh, let's see, it's about 100 base pairs plus that 100. Yeah, you're getting pretty close. You're at like 4 kb or something with all this stuff and nothing else added <coughs> right and uh, and you know if you only have 4.4 you know that's a uh, Yeah, no, I mean, you're you're struggling. You're struggling to get anything else in there. You can't fit template DNA or anything like that. Um, so AAV is a tough choice. Lentivirus, um, its packaging capacity. Lentivirus. is about nine kilobases, right? So you're talking 9,000 base pairs. 
The problem with lentivirus is that lentivirus likes to incorporate its uh, DNA into the genome, right? And uh, that's tough if you're trying to use it for some clinical application, right? Because you, it incorporates it in a, a pseudo-random way. You don't want it incorporating the DNA into some place that causes something bad to happen in the genome. So generally, people stay away from lentiviruses, um, except for research studies. Um, generally, people stay away from them. All right, so those are the ways of delivering. Now, AAV virus, it has the, uh, the highest efficiency of infecting the cell and getting the Cas9 in there. So generally, people use AAV viruses when they can, or viruses in general, when they're trying to use Cas9. Plasmids are probably the second most popular, or might even be the most popular. AAVs are sick. And then using the actual Cas9 protein and gRNA that have already been made, this is probably the third most popular. And uh, it's, yeah, it's not something people do on the regular necessarily. Now, in the class, what we do is we use DNA plasmids and single-stranded DNA for the template, right? So the Cas9 protein is encoded in a plasmid, the sgRNA is encoded in another plasmid, and the template is a separate piece of DNA. Now, this decreases the efficiency a lot. If you encoded them all in the same plasmid, it would probably be a lot more efficient. But for teaching purposes, it makes it really nice because then you understand you have these three separate parts that have to be included in order for the CRISPR experiment to work. And uh, I use CRISPR with a lot of hesitance because I don't like the word CRISPR. <coughs> All right. Any questions so far? Any questions? All right, so what happens if you want to design your own CRISPR? How does that work? <clears throat> now, let's see, let me do this real quick. So the way the guide RNA works, you got your DNA, the way the guide RNA works is it binds to 20 base pairs in DNA, right? So the guide RNA comes in and it binds to 20 base pairs in DNA. And that's where it knows to do its business, right? So generally when people refer to the guide RNA, they're just referring to these 20 base pairs though there are more base pairs after it. Now, the PAM sequence <coughs> um, has, the, the guide RNA has what's, has to end at what's called a PAM sequence. Oh gosh, another acronym, PAM. <coughs> this stands for protospacer adjacent motif. Now, the protospace adjacent motif is NGG, where N means any base pair, and GG means a G, a guanine, and a guanine base pair, right? NGG. So, the guide RNA can only bind near an NGG, or if it's on the opposite strand, a CCN, right? But that's it. Now... This sounds complicated. If you want to design a guide RNA to target a gene you're interested in, you don't have to go through the genomes and search and find something, right? 
what we can do <coughs> uh, is there's actually programs you can use, you know? Exciting programs. So, now there's a couple. If you're just trying to find um, guide RNAs yourself, you don't want to order anything yet, you just want to find them out, Chop Chop is a good program. Um, now there's a bunch of different programs and they use a bunch of different algorithms and a bunch of different scoring mechanisms, right? Um, so uh, I wouldn't, you know, like, Try, try to use your best judgment, but like there's no necessarily correct or incorrect answer. So what we want to do is a knockout. That's what we taught. A knockout is when you do non-homologous end joining. What gene we want to target? I don't know. Let's say myostatin <coughs> in humans. We want to knock out the myostatin gene in humans and get big muscles. Now what this does is boom, it gives us a bunch of possible guide RNAs. Now remember I talked about, it's just the 20 base pairs of the guide RNA. The guide RNA is actually a lot longer, um, but this is just the 20 base pairs. And uh, it gives you an efficiency score, you know, with their fancy algorithm and stuff like that. It gives you mismatches, right? So there's this talk in CRISPR, you might hear a lot about it, of off-target effects. Now sometimes what happens is the guide RNA binds a piece of DNA that's similar to it, right? So MM0 is zero mismatches, so is there a... a a copy of this sequence elsewhere in the genome. If mismatch is zero, the answer is no. Is there a, a place in the genome where there's one mismatch? So say one base pair is changed. No. Two mismatches where two base pairs are changed. No. Three. No. You can see some of these have like three mismatches, right? So while I don't know if there are any cases of people detecting off-target effects on three mismatches, it's just trying to be um, safe. Now, generally, when you're doing a CRISPR experiment, it's good to test multiple different um, guide RNAs and target sequences so that uh, you you can figure out which one works best empirically. Um, but if you had to just choose one, you'd probably just choose the one that they give you that has no mismatches, no self-complementarity, and is the most efficient, right? All right. Now, what if you just wanted to order one? So there are companies like Atom, and uh, they really should should pay me to advertise for them. And you could do the same thing. Now, we want to use a wild type Cas9, not a Nick Ace. Um, Nick Ace is a whole nother thing. Um, what gene? We could do myostatin again. <laughs> And what this does is it gives us scores and uh, tells us, gives us, you know, guide RNAs and scores. And we get to choose which ones we want. So it has three. But if we just want one, we can choose the best one that has a score of 100. Um, the sequence is TAC. Let's see if we can find it in Chop Chop. Oh, it's ranked number nine in Chop Chop. Here it's ranked number one. Who knows? Like I said, you know, 
uh, use your judgment. It, these things aren't, they're trying to make predictions. They're not empirical. Now, what will happen is they will make a vector. Let's see. We want some canamycin, high copy number, expression marker, puromycin. All right, we'll take it. E1 alpha, transient. All right. So here we go. So we got, it doesn't matter. We'll select our, for $300, we'll take this gRNA, put it in a plasmid with Cas9. So you'll have a Cas9 gRNA plasmid that you can use for genome editing experiments in humans, all for the low price of $300. Now they probably won't give you enough to actually do anything. You can ask them for a MIDI prep, which is about 100 micrograms of DNA. Understand the average gene therapy using DNA is probably like 20 milligrams. So 100 micrograms is, um, you know, 20 times, 200 times less, right? Um, but there's other companies who will purify large amounts of DNA. You know, if you wanted to get a gene therapy of, you know, this gRNA targeting myostatin with Cas9, um, the cost would probably run less than $2,000 for like 20 milligrams, less than $2,000 for sure, or something around there. So that's, that's how easy, you, like you don't even have to know much to design your own gRNA. Since every organism can have its own genome, these scores are just looking at specific populations, right? Generally, though each, say, human or each cell in a human body can have a slightly different genome, it's okay to um, assume that these will work in, say, 99.999% of humans, right? Like, it's, it's, it's okay to assume that. You can choose the organism, right? So if you're looking at, um, for instance, I don't know if Adam let you do it. Chop, chop. Let's see. Yeah, so you can choose the organism, right? The species and stuff like that. Um, if you had your own genome sequence and you were really, you know, trying to get serious, you could also do that. But like I said, generally, um, it's unlikely that you're going to have a mutation in this specific 20 base pair region in a gene. Highly unlikely. Or an organism is. So that's not something you have to worry too much about. So you have your CRISPR experiment. Um, you should catch up on experiments if you haven't. And the CRISPR experiment, uh, you know, it's uh, one of the last experiments for the class. So catch up on all that stuff. Next week, we'll be here to answer all your questions and chat. Um, and remember, tomorrow, Netflix documentary comes out, Unnatural Selection. I'm in it. I'm going to be uh, one of the main characters. It's a four-part series. And uh, I hope I'm not too cringy, but uh, you should watch it. Um, check, out, check it out. Unnatural Selection on Netflix comes out tomorrow. Otherwise, if there are no questions, I will see you all next week. And uh, yeah. Oh, I forgot my face isn't there. Ah!